Formed in 1964, the Velvet Underground would redefine the New York musical scene, and at their center was Brooklyn-born singer-songwriter Lou Reed. An early devotee of many musical forms pioneered in New York, including doo-wop, bebop, and free jazz, he married his interest in music with an equal interest in poetry and literature. It was Reed's lyrics, first and foremost, that reflected a side to the city that had not previously been captured in rock music. Like the great songwriters of Broadway and the Brill Building, however, this was very much a studded craft. Lou Reed's songs reflect the streets of New York, if you will. He went to the University of Syracuse, where a number of uh, very successful people were. Betsy Johnson was there at the same time he was there. Felix Papadieri was there at the same time he was there. And uh, he had this wonderful teacher named Elmo Schwartz, a great uh, poet who was very famous in his day. He really uh, helped Lou hone his skills at writing short stories and poems. Lou then taught himself how to transfer a short story into a song lyric. So it's, it's, there's a lot of technical skill in Lou Reed. He's sort of like Dylan. He's a real craftsman. He learned his craft in the old-fashioned way. He studied it, like, like, academically. After graduating in 1963, Reed returned to New York City and began his tenure as a hired songwriter, very much in the Brill Building tradition. Through this position, he fortuitously came into contact with a key musical ally, the classically trained John Cale. The world of avant-garde composition in New York was as important a part of its musical landscape as jazz, and Welshman Cale had traveled to the city both to study and to participate in this scene. Here he met and began to work with leading minimalist composer Lamont Young, and before being introduced to Reed, he was fully immersed in the experimental world. The combination of Reed's lyrics and Cale's avant-garde musical approach would form the core of the Velvet Underground's aesthetic. Lou Reed was a staff songwriter for Pickwick Records, in Queens, and he was kind of grinding out these sub burl building imitations of current trends of the day. And he might have met John Cale sooner or later because there was some overlap in their circles, but it was kind of a fluke that they met because Lou Reed did a single called The Ostrich, released under the name The Primitives, but it's really his single. Terry Phillips, a producer of Pickwick Records, was looking for a band to promote that single live. And at a party in New York, he saw this guy with a British accent, or he thought it was a British accent, with long hair, and said, are you a musician? And John Cale was the guy, and he said, yes. And Terry Phillips said, I want you to come to Pickwick to meet this guy, Lou Reed, and maybe see about working with him in a band. And John Cale, really just for a laugh, went to Queens to see what this whole deal was about, because he never played rock music, really. And when he heard this song, The Ostrich, kind of a primitive garage rock single, which is still pretty weird, something clicked because John Cale said, Lou Reed is playing this guitar with all the strings tuned to the same note. That's what I'm doing in a different way with Lamont Young's group. And I think they both realized simultaneously the distance between avant-garde music and rock music is not so great after all. And that's really the spark that formed the Velvet Underground. Underground were unique in large part because of the marriage of John Cale and, and Lou Reed. When you listen to the early Velvet Underground demos, it's fascinating because the group, the, the, the songs that Lou Reed was writing before John Cale got involved with him were essentially folk songs. And you can hear versions of these songs, um, and they're, they're commercially available now. You can hear versions of these songs that show that Lou Reed had a real Bob Dylan fixation. He's never John Cale hated folk music with a vengeance, and he very quickly got the harmonica out of the group and he replaced it with the drone, the idea of this drone. And I think something that the Velvet Underground kind of invented for rock music was uh, the idea of the sort of the one chord drone. And this came certainly from the avant-garde, from the minimalist, from the kind of music that John Cale had been coming through with Lamont Young. 
uh, where you can take a chord, you can take a note, and you might just play it for hours on end. Lou Reed is an amazing talent, but one can't really imagine that Lou Reed would have done the Velvet Underground had he not had John Cale for one, giving him that minimalist avant-garde side, and Andy Warhol for another, saying, you can do this and make it art, and, and you can justify it as art, you don't have to compromise it. Warhol was not only a key figure in the Velvet Underground's rise, he was vital to the very essence of the emerging New York culture that the band would become a part of. A fine artist who had begun his career in illustration and advertising, he rose to prominence in the late 1950s and early 60s as a leading figure of the American pop art movement. By the time that he was both revolutionizing and scandalizing the American art world with his celebrations of consumer culture and celebrity, he had established his studio, The Factory, in midtown Manhattan and was surrounding himself with both key assistants and a menagerie of bohemian eccentrics. Just as he was becoming recognized as a bizarre celebrity in his own right, Warhol decided to broaden his palette and by 1963 he was moving into new artistic territories. He starts off as being a pop painter. Pop was a movement, not unlike the beat or the punk movement. It was this intense, small movement of a group of people who were incredibly turned on, right, who went, you know, crazy, and then it became like a big international success, right? So, and Warhol very cleverly understood that the image of the artist was going to be the real thing that carried the work, more than actually just the work itself. The other pop artists never really dressed in a, in a way that would be striking, whereas Warhol always had his costume and his mask on, right? Then Warhol went into underground film, and the underground film scene in New York, I think, has been overlooked. It was an incredibly important and vibrant scene. All these things, you know, in New York City, it's, it's, New York City is so compact that every scene bleeds into another scene, so you, you can never quite take something in isolation. That's the beauty of New York City. So what you have is on the Lower East Side, uh, you have this uh, movement coming along of underground films, and Jonas Mikas is uh, the, the really important figurehead here. But Andy Warhol sees what's going on, and he wants to be a part of it. Very interesting, though, he very quickly became celebrated for his underground movies. So here's this guy kind of jumping in from a different scene, and yet he got the respect, and so by the time he actually uh, latches onto the Velvet Underground, I think they would have looked at Andy Warhol and said, now that's a name that we want to be involved in. After Reed and Cale's meeting in 1964, the pair had formed the Velvet Underground and recruited a university cohort of Reed's Sterling Morrison as guitarist and occasional bassist, and his friend, the unconventional drummer Maureen Tucker. Despite their unique sound, by December 1965, the band arranged shows in the only district available at the time, Greenwich Village's folk circuit. Yet it was here, at the Café Bazaar, that Warhol, now looking at spreading his interests even further into the world of rock music, approached them with the intention of making them his act. Andy Warhol was looking for a rock group. The Velvet Underground start their residency at the Café Bazaar. Andy Warhol comes and sees them and says, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you know, let me manage you, which was really the saying, let me make you my art project and you could be something really, really exciting. And the Velvet Underground was smart enough to say, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll go with you. How did he know how great they were? How, how, how did it happen? I mean, Warhol just seemed perfect. How, how does he know so much about what makes good, what would make for good music that he could pick out the very best band that, uh, of, of all time, practically, um, from some little, um, nowhere club in the West Village and, um, and, and make himself associated with them. Um, it's astonishing. Almost immediately, Warhol made his presence felt. Happy with Reed's songs and with Kale's esoteric arrangements, he nonetheless insisted that the Velvets adopt one of his entourage, Nico, to front the band alongside Reed. A German model and actress, she had moved to New York in the late 1950s and had been the muse of both the Rolling Stones' Brian Jones and Bob Dylan. Despite Reed and Cale's reluctance, Warhol's plans for the band and the attention he would bring them convinced them to comply. The Velvet Underground were clearly not an act that would fit into the conservative confines of Greenwich Village, and so Warhol found them both a venue and a stage show that would suit their more extreme form of New York music. The result was a multimedia extravaganza in the Lower East Side, known as the Exploding Plastic Inevitable. One of the key things about the, 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 the movement that happened in New York, and it carries on through to the 70s, is the lack of underground rock clubs. 
in, in New York City. This was a, a city that was thriving musically, everything from the vocal groups, you know, through jazz and, and then, of course, especially the folk scene and the Brill building scene. Folk scene had umpteen basket houses and, and clubs and, you know, nice little places to play in Greenwich Village. And yet there was all this talent living on the, on, on the Lower East Side slash East Village with nowhere to play. And this kind of becomes a regular story because uh, the Fugs ran into this. They put on uh, shows at the Bridge Theatre and St. Mark's Place. And um, Warhol and his crowd, his minions, the people who worked for him, were smart enough to say, you know, there's a place on St. Mark's Place. This is the centre of the East Village. We can hire a place here. We can make it a happening. The word happening was, was certainly going around. It, 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 it was the idea that, you know, art bled into music, bled into film, bled into sort of performance theatre. Jackie Onassis went to a show. I mean, people were coming from all over the place to see those shows, not just the downtown scene. They were spectacular shows. They were spectacles, you know. They were also, they were Andy Warhol events. You know, they, you remember the word happening? You used to have happenings, big art thing. In a sense, it was like a taking the concept of the happening to an, to a, a, an extreme. Using rock and roll music, obviously, is the, is the bed of the whole thing. Is, is brilliant because it brings a much, much wider audience than, than an artistic happening. It certainly was the introduction to a whole new world. It changed everything, and it changed everything in New York, too. Certainly by 67, New York is the happening place. And that is really almost singularly because of Andy Warhol and what he did. Obviously, Lou Reed, the Velvet Underground, all these people are, are, are very much part of it, and I think Lou deserves enormous credit for, for writing that scene into existence in his songs and stuff and so on. But really, the, the root of it is Andy Warhol. You know, and at the time, yes, that was a real scene. That was a scene. But did it create a scene around it? Not that I'm aware of. As much as the exploding plastic inevitable had placed the Velvets in the spotlight, there was indeed no musical movement immediately influenced by it. This was an art scene, as much defined by Warhol as by the band themselves. The shows did attract a lot of press for the Velvets, both positive and negative, and rather than now look for a record company to invest in a debut album, Warhol had his own ideas about how to get the band into the recording studio, a do-it-yourself mentality that was unheard of in the music industry at the time. They took the money and made their own record. Groups were not doing that. Groups would play concerts or play clubs hoping to get signed, and the record company would tell them what to do, and then in the Beatles case, you know, if you got popular enough, then you could start telling the record company what you wanted to do. Andy Warhol turned to the Velvet Underground and said, no, 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 this is art. What you do is you make your art, and in a very, you know, in a very Warholian way, I think he said to them, you make your art, and then you can mass produce it. You know, you can kind of, in a way, silk screen it. But what you do is you make the art piece. You don't compromise that art piece. It's your art, and then you let people buy it. But you don't let somebody tell you how to do your art any more than I would let somebody tell me how to do my painting. I know that Lou Reed has always said that the thing he got from Warhol was you don't compromise. Without Warhol, I don't think they'd have had the guts to do it. I'm not sure John Cale, he may have had the guts to do it. He may not have known how to do it and present it into a rock format. And Warhol was the one who was able to say, we do this as an art piece. Then you sell that art piece to the public. And if you can you know, silk screen it 100,000 times, great. You'll make a lot of money doing it. Released in March 1967, The Velvet Underground and Nico did not make a lot of money. A revolutionary album poorly promoted and banned from several record stores, its meditations on drug abuse, sadomasochism and death were totally out of sync with an audience gearing up for the summer of love. It took me a long time to adjust to The Velvet Underground as a kid. I, I came from uh, Kentucky to New York and when I was a teenager, when I first heard The Velvet Underground, when I was uh, 17 or 18, um, they sounded ludicrous to me. They sounded like a really bad Bob Dylan imitation. That's the only way I could explain, them to, my, explain it to myself where, where they were coming from. Um, you know, with that kind of sneering, non-singing, singing, singing um, and, but, and the music being so crude, um, with still this simplicity and this kind of natural melodies, but played so crudely. But now, after all these years, 
the Velvet Underground is the is really the most reliable music there is for me. If, uh, of, of all the of all the bands and of all time in rock and roll, um, if I want to put on something that um, will satisfy me, I reach for the Velvet Underground. <laughs>